Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webcast. This is part three in a series uh, called Kubernetes in the Cloud from the SNEA Cloud Storage Technologies Initiative. And today on the phone, we have uh, myself. I am Mike Jockinson, and I'm today's host. I'm part of the SNEA CSTI. Today with me, I've got Paul Burt, who is a technical product marketing engineer from NetApp. Paul, how Hello, are you doing? Hello, everyone. Excellent. And then Ingo well. Fuchs. Ingo is its Chief Technologist Cloud and DevOps from NetApp. Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. I'm going to go through just a couple of upfront legal notices and a little background, and then Ingo and Paul will launch into today's webcast. So if you've attended our webcast before, you've seen this slide. But this is just a quick reminder to you that the material that we're going to show you today is copyrighted by SNEA. If you are an individual member or a member of a member company of SNEA, you are free to use this material as long as you adhere to the legalese on the screen, which says that you must use any slide or slides reproduced in their entirety, and you must give an attribution to SNEA as the source of this material. And then finally, on this slide, this is advice. None of us are attorneys, and none of us are your attorneys. So if you are looking for legal advice, go to your own attorneys. There are no warranties with this information. Who is SNEA? SNEA is a very large industry-leading organization that promotes storage networking. And we work with a number of large companies throughout the industry who are members of SNEA or interested in the organization. There are over 2,000 active contributing members either from these large organizations or individuals in the industry who participate in SNEA. And then finally, there are over 50,000 people who are on the distribution list for SNEA. The CSTI, Cloud Storage Technologies Initiative, has a mission to educate vendors and users on cloud storage technologies, including the data services and the orchestration capabilities that are important to cloud storage users. To do that, we support and promote the business models and the architecture, a number of them listed here. We seek to understand what the needs are for cloud storage, both from a hyperscale, hyperscaler requirement, as well as uh, the tier twos and the enterprises who are building cloud storage technologies. And then we, finally, we collaborate with others, other industry associations to drive this information out. OK, I mentioned that this is part three in the series. So a quick reminder, there were two previous webcasts. Uh, first, I had hosted a webcast part one, which was a quick overview of what is Kubernetes and Kubernetes in the cloud and how it touches storage. Uh, Ingo and one of his counterparts from NetApp participated in that. And then following that, we had part two, which dove more into persistent storage. My colleague Michelle from the CSTI hosted that with some of her counterparts from IBM. So today, we are going to dive deeper into the uh, technologies. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ingo, who will run through today's agenda. Ingo? All right. Thank you, Mike, and welcome, everybody. I think this is going to be a really, really interesting uh, webcast. And Paul has just a, a large number of really interesting insights and best practices lined up for you. So today, we're going to mostly talk about the differences between using Kubernetes as a platform for deploying stateful versus stateless applications. Obviously, as you're going to a stateful application where it actually matters what data you're retaining, some of the challenges are changing a little bit. So you got to think about the life cycle of the application and the container differently. There's some learning curves uh, to go through and some learnings to learn from that others have already experienced. So you don't make the same mistakes that others may, may have done. There are some really good tools that can help you go through this. And of course, as you're storing data, security is absolutely paramount. So Paul will walk us through all of these different aspects. And then best practices to very efficiently and effectively run stateful workloads on a Kubernetes deployments. 
And then maybe best of all, at the end of the session, we have a huge list of really, really helpful links and resources that will help you as you're tackling this maybe sometimes slightly daunting task. So with that, let me uh, bring up Paul. Let's dive right in. So why, from your perspective, is Kubernetes so relevant as IT moves closer to private and public cloud or hybrid cloud or even hybrid multi-cloud? Yeah, that's a great question, Ingo, and uh, thank you to you and Mike for the, the great introduction there. So uh, hello, everyone. Um, so Kubernetes has been deemed the Linux of the cloud by Jim Zemlin, the executive director of the Linux Foundation. Um, that happened a couple of months ago at, a, I believe, a Google Cloud event that he was at. And what he means by that is really that Kubernetes is the new layer that and most operators are going to work at. Uh, if you use Linux, you probably very rarely uh, need to reach below sort of the layer of user space and um, muck around in the kernel or anything along those lines. And um, Kubernetes uh, for distributed systems is doing what Linux did for individual systems uh, way back when. Um, and it's still doing today, uh, you could say. So uh, the development experience has changed a bit uh, resultingly. Um, most people are going to use Kubernetes as their primary sort of interface. Uh, so that's great. Um, Kubernetes runs primarily container-based technology. Uh, and that does change things a little bit, as uh, Ingo mentioned in the agenda slide. So uh, this is a great blog post uh, that came out uh, maybe a couple of years ago by Uber Engineering, where they shared some insights about dockerizing MySQL there. Um, and they have anywhere from hundreds to thousands of uh, MySQL instances running consecutively. Uh, and their advice in this blog post uh, was actually relatively uh, interesting in that they recommended that most people do not do what they are doing. Um, if you can avoid running stateful workloads in Kubernetes. Uh, you should avoid running stateful workloads in Kubernetes, which uh, is pretty interesting um, since they're sharing that that's exactly what they're doing. And one of the big uh, factors involved in that is just that there's a large learning curve. Uh, a lot of the tools that you need to use, and, uh, a lot of the, the Kubernetes functionality um, that you may know how to do innately with a VM um, has suddenly shifted to uh, a new platform or a new interface for you uh, inside of a container. So um, there's, there's a little bit of training that has to happen as well. So uh, once you cover that training, once you get that learning, um, it's a little bit easier, but uh, it's still recommended that you stick to sort of the old ways of running stateful work if you can swing that. Um, you know, Kelsey Hightower is a big luminary in the Kubernetes space as well, um, and he sort of echoes this sentiment, just to let you know that uh, Uber isn't alone in this recommendation here. Um, and I would say the one thing that Kubernetes does give you is consistency at scale. So if you're able to take advantage of that uh, large scale with the stateful workloads, then Kubernetes can be a great option, but uh, you should just know that uh, there's a lot of complexity uh, in there as well. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, Paul. And so for those of us that, that are actually making the move into moving stateful applications and uh, into a containerized environment and deploying this in a, uh, in a distributed environment using container platforms, one of the big concerns that we're going through is how do I reduce risk? And one of the specific risks when it comes to these environments is how do I store secrets? Can you talk a little bit about what secrets are and what some of the best practices are for... Uh, uh, you know, to consider as you're managing secrets and securing secrets in this environment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, glad you asked. So uh, secrets management is an important part of Kubernetes. Uh, and with containers, uh, they tend to be isolated from the rest of your workloads, uh, just kind of generally. So you need to figure out a mechanism for, uh, you know, getting things like passwords or login IDs or um, even a token that you've been given from uh, your cloud provider, whatever you use to access your database or your cloud resources, um, that can be thought of as a secret. And uh, inside of Kubernetes, there's a mechanism called etcd that is sort of uh, storing um, your, your secrets for you inside of the cluster. Um, and that's sort of just a simple key value store that runs on the Raft consensus algorithm. But uh, there's some risks. 
that uh, come along with that out of the box if you don't tweak or tune that. So, um, you know, prior to version 1.13, um, etcd was not encrypted at rest uh, for the data that it transmitted. Um, it may not have SSL or TLS turned on for the peer-to-peer -peer communication between etcd nodes. So. Um, just reading the, the standard documentation for uh, secrets management on the Kubernetes IO docs, as pictured here, uh, is a great place to start. They'll give you some great sort of advice on, um, you know, turning those knobs like encryption at rest and uh, TLS, uh, you know, for setting up your own cluster or things to check uh, in that sort of realm. Um, and then we have a couple other uh, sort of recommendations like uh, you probably want to turn on RBAC, which is role-based access controls. You want to um, have a good idea of who is doing what and uh, make sure you're restricting the privilege to do, uh, you know, some of these higher order or uh, more dangerous admin type tasks to the correct people. So uh, this is all online um, in sort of that previous page, but uh, there are other factors as well. You may uh, want to store secrets um, in an external store. So most cloud providers have something called a KMS, that's your key management service. Um, and there are projects like this GoDaddy project, Kubernetes External Secrets, that make it simple for you to store your uh, token for that uh, secret uh, inside of your container and sort of ship it uh, through Git cleanly. Um, without exposing any uh, important information. Um, there are other popular tools in the space, such as HashiCorp Vault. Um, this one's particularly popular if you wanna run your own equivalent of that cloud-based KMS or key management service. Um, and I particularly like Vault uh, because they have a lot of great online learning material. So uh, they have uh, you know, tutorial section that you can just click through here. Um, and it really, you know, guides you through getting started with this. Uh, if you're an advanced user and you want to jump ahead, um, you can also choose some of those more advanced tutorials as well. So uh, I appreciate that about Vault too. Um, and then finally, um, if you want even more training, uh, we're going to be throwing a lot of links at you this presentation. So uh, sit tight. Uh, as was mentioned, we'll have some uh, links, uh, a list of links at the end of this, and then a sort of summary list of links in a blog post. Um, but this is yet another resource for learning about uh, stateful workloads and um, secret, secrets management. Uh, this is Catacoda. So if you would like to experiment with Kubernetes, Um, and last but not least, uh, if you're looking for some authoritative information on Kubernetes security beyond what is just publicly available, or um, you want to learn about, say, rootless containers, um, any other more kind of advanced practices uh, around container management, uh, there's a great book out called Kubernetes Security. This is by Liz Rice and Michael Hausenblaus. And uh, both of them are, uh, you know, well-known uh, developer advocates in the Kubernetes space. And uh, it's just a couple bucks on O'Reilly if you want to do it that way. Or, um, you know, this page that we have pictured here uh, looks like Aquasec has it online if you would like to exchange some information um, with them and uh, get your free download copy. So that, that's another way to access this. Well, that's great. Thank you, Paul, very much for sharing some of the key considerations and best practices and ideas for where to find more. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit and get into stateful applications. A lot of our customers are looking at uh, using Kubernetes or containerized environments for running database applications. Uh, what are some of the key considerations for organizations going down that path? Yeah, let's let's dive in. So uh, as mentioned uh, in sort of the intro section, you probably want to stick with your traditional sort of tools if you already have those, if they work for you. Um, those are great. And uh, one of the big reasons for that is the learning curve is just really simple when it comes to Kubernetes knowledge. Uh, you know, in the previous two uh, sort of iterations of this webcast series, we covered a lot of ideas like PVs, PVCs, uh, those are persistent volumes and storage classes and uh, a lot of other technical terminology that's required to attach storage and manage it inside of Kubernetes. 
Um, in contrast, uh, if you are running a database on a VM, which you probably already have all of the tools you need, um, all you really need to know for Kubernetes is what a service is. So uh, it's rel relatively straightforward to uh, just expose that service to your Kubernetes cluster. Um, I particularly like this guide from Google Cloud on, uh, you know, they mentioned three different ways on how to map the service to your cluster. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's relatively straightforward. This is an example of a YAML file that you would submit to Kubernetes. Um, it is, uh, you know, it's easy to read and see kind of exactly what's going on. We're exposing a service that we're naming Mongo. Um, and we're pointing to a URL where our service is located. So, um, you know, then when we need to access our service, we have an application that has to um, reach out and get some data from our Mongo database. All they're doing is using Mongo as a URI um, or the, the sort of uh, URL indicator um, that they're gonna try and access that through. So it just makes it nice and easy to um, discover the service for applications that are running inside of your cluster. Uh, if you need to do uh, some more advanced uh, configuration, like you need to tweak uh, the ports that are being exposed or anything along those lines, um, that is an option as well. Uh, this is another YAML file. Those three dashes are YAML's uh, kind of funky way of separating two distinct YAML files, but um, having them be saved on a, a single flat file. Um, so this is really two YAML files. One is exposing the service, as you can see up top, um, and the other is exposing the endpoint, um, which is this time pointing at an IP address and um, a specific port. And in this case as well, we're naming our service Mongo uh, and exposing that to our cluster. So um, it's very easy for any application that's running inside there to uh, discover it and um, get started. And that's it. Uh, you know, it's, it's super easy to uh, really get started this way and expose all of your work. So if, if you currently have databases that um, you would love to connect to your uh, state lists workloads that you're running in Kubernetes, um, things like web servers or um, any business application logic that's running, um, that's what Kubernetes really excels at, running lots and lots of those uh, sorts of applications applications inside, and then um, you're connecting them to your, uh, you know, currently fine technology that's running outside, um, and everything just kind of fits together really nice and neatly. So this is uh, one of the best ways to actually start running um, Kubernetes, but uh, there are obviously more ahead of us. Um, you know, another option that we covered previously is running through a stateful set in Kubernetes, and this was sort of mentioned in uh, part two of our webinar series, uh, and this is where the complexity starts to creep in. Uh, this is what Uber was talking about when they warned people to be careful um, and only really use Kubernetes in this way if uh, they, they saw some benefit from relying on Kubernetes for its ability to scale. Um, you know, if, if that sounds like you, if you're running tens or hundreds or thousands of uh, stateful databases or stateful workloads, um, this is something to look at. So it's a little more complexity, uh, requires understanding of things like init containers. Those are containers that uh, tell your storage application what order to sort of get started in. Um, there may be dependent your cluster properly already. Um, so init containers can help with that. Um, you know, we covered persistent volumes, persistent volume claims, storage classes uh, in the previous series. That's how you attach your storage layer to the Kubernetes system. Um, we already had a look at services, which are how we do service discovery and sort of map names onto our Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and then uh, there are things like pods and config maps that can help as well. So a pod is just a logical grouping of containers that uh, may make up an application. You may have multiple containers running that um, complete a total application. So a common example is you may have a logging layer, um, a metrics layer. Um, these things run as what's called a sidecar sometimes. 
Um, so you could have your database container and then these two additional containers running next to it. The three of them together would make up a pod. Uh, and then config maps are just a nice, neat way to uh, take advantage of some of Kubernetes knowledge about your state of your cluster um, and map that onto uh, sort of easy to remember or easy to use names. So uh, all of that goes into a stateful set potentially. Um, so there is a decent learning curve here. Um, and we should just note that uh, that translates into complexity for you when you're managing the service. So uh, that is what Uber was mentioning when um, they first really dove into this. So if you're looking for a review of what some of those terms are or, uh, you know, what, what is a PV, how is that different from a PVC, um, this slide is from part two in this web series. Um, I highly recommend going back and checking out that content. Um, I think this is a great way to refresh on, um, you know, what these state sets uh, look like. But uh, in any event, um, there are a lot of moving parts and uh, some great tutorials online for uh, accessing this, which we'll, we'll link to in a, a little bit here as well. Um, so the, the link to uh, these, um, how to do this, uh, there are two great resources, I would say. Um, if you go to the Kubernetes IO site, uh, as pictured here, uh, there's a great uh, resource under the task section, uh, which is what we see. Um, I'll walk you through setting up a stateful set in various uh, sort of configurations. Uh, one's replicated, one's not. Um, you know, if you are running this in production, it's highly recommended that you do this uh, in, in a replicated and uh, you know, secure fashion. Containers are by their design immutable and ephemeral. Um, so using them to run stateful workloads like databases uh, is part of uh, why all of this complexity sort of arises. Uh, but this is a great introduction. Um, and then the tutorials tab that is right next to the task section um, also has some information on uh, how to run these uh, stateful workloads using stateful sets. So um, these guides are, I think, uh, a great way if someone is suggesting that you use Kubernetes to run your database. Um, step through these and, you know, get a taste of the complexity for yourself. Uh, don't take my word for it, you know, reserve a half an hour and uh, walk through the guides. And if you get stuck on anything, uh, there's an, a very active Slack community uh, for Kubernetes that can help you sort of step through uh, any areas you get uh, stumped on. That's really great information. Thank you, Paul. Uh, just a quick comment for the audience. Uh, we have been having a few audio dropouts here. It looks like Bright Talk is having a little bit of an issue. We'll power through it. If something isn't clear as Paul is working through it, as you're, you're maybe losing a few seconds, uh, please just post a question on the link and we'll cover it either in the question and answer session or in the FAQ we're going to publish later. So with that, uh, Paul, let's move from installation to what's almost more important, uh, certainly more important for some of us, which is how do I operate this thing? How do I keep it running? How do I keep it operational? What does my day two operations look like? So let's dive into that a little bit. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so uh, some of those day two operations, uh, it's important to remember that you're not just installing your database and using it. Uh, you want to think about how to update your database, um, how to restore from a backup in case of a calamity. Um, you know, how are you scaling that database if you need uh, to, you, you get a swarm of traffic on your site and uh, that becomes your bottleneck. Uh, and then finally, how are you deleting or decommissioning the database if uh, you ever need to? So you kind of want to have a plan for all of these parts of the life cycle. So in addition to that complexity or that learning curve that we discussed up front, um, you should have a plan for all of this as well. Uh, and this is going to uh, flow nicely into another topic that uh, we'll discuss. Um, but for now, um, I'd just like to note again that uh, you absolutely want replication and failover for your database if you are uh, running a stateful set for your database workload on Kubernetes. Um, and this is generally, uh, or I guess I should say, it's not uh, set up for a production workload. 
if you are following some of the tutorials that we linked earlier. So um, be sure to grab that Kubernetes security book, um, you know, check out other best practices, find other uh, sort of guides for running production ready uh, workloads and uh, check that out as well. They, they should cover um, kind of the basics of replication, recovering from failure, uh, all the important things that uh, we wish didn't happen, but always seem to happen when we're running uh, production workloads uh, in a distributed system. So, uh, you know, with those day two sort of operations, those things like restoring from backups or, uh, you know, decommissioning or upgrading um, the database, uh, it's worth talking about operators. So operators uh, like, are like stateful sets. Um, they run inside of your Kubernetes cluster and they do require uh, all of the knowledge that you would require to uh, run a stateful set. Um, but there's an additional layer of uh, the operator has some, some tooling with it. Um, so an operator is just uh, application operational knowledge captured in software. It's, it's in other words, like a playbook, um, the sort of thing you would write in Puppet or Chef or Ansible. Um, sorry, excuse me and use to deploy your application. Um, <clears throat> an operator uh, allows you to do that much more easily by leveraging Kubernetes um, and even programming Kubernetes to take specific actions in case uh, a certain event occurs. Um, so, uh, you know, this happens through uh, sort of function in Kubernetes called CRD or custom resource definition. Um, all that really means is you're using Kubernetes API uh, to program your own sort of logic layer uh, of how you would like Kubernetes to behave uh, under certain conditions. Um, and you also get to leverage, uh, you know, all of the information that Kubernetes has about your application because these, these CRDs are smart. They have access to um, all of Kubernetes knowledge of what's happening inside of your cluster. So um, this is a standard layer that should be available on most uh, modern Kubernetes distribution, sorry, distributions. It's been uh, generally available for the last couple uh, minor versions of Kubernetes uh, for some time now. Um, and if you have more questions about specifically what makes an operator, uh, you know, there's, there are seven principles that CoreOS uh, sort of wrote about when they introduced the concept of operators a couple years ago. Um, and these are simple things like, uh, you know, it should always be backwards compatible and understand version numbers. Uh, it should leverage primitives that are already in Kubernetes like services. Um, so um, some very basic uh, sort of notes for anyone who's interested in uh, crafting their own operator. Uh, and the reason for operators is it saves us from some tasks like this. So what we have pictured here is a command that you might enter to uh, create an etcd node that would join a cluster. Uh, and, you know, there's maybe 10 different flags on the screen from name all the way to enable pprof. Um, there's a lot of uh, IP addresses and URLs and uh, the, the short and long of this is it's very easy to mistype something or to get something wrong here uh, when you're entering this command to create an etcd node and add it to a cluster. Uh, so an operator can help with that. Um, as mentioned, CRDs have information about where resources are located, uh, maybe what their IP address is. Um, they can store information about uh, you know, what node, uh, what cluster size you want your, your node to join. Um, so all of these sort of fields and flags can be automatically filled in by an operator, sort of uh, dramatically simplifying uh, these types of commands. Um, so a great example of this is with Couchbase. Uh, it, it is an operator that is available on Kubernetes. It's a, a database that's fairly popular. Um, and I like to use this example because uh, if you're using Couchbase's backup manager tool, uh, it has to match the exact major and minor version number of the Couchbase cluster that you're um, sort of using. So uh, the nice part of using the Couchbase operator is uh, it includes the C backup manager uh, along with uh, all of that information. So.
So uh, why not use an operator for everything? Well, uh, as mentioned, uh, in addition to all of the complexity that comes and the learning curve that comes with stateful sets, uh, operators add even more complexity on top of that by having this additional layer of automation. So um, sometimes you may find that the operator uh, brings more complexity than is really it's solving uh, to begin with. Um, so it kind of depends on how difficult it is to manage the underlying stateful application to begin with. Um, and yeah, it, it's just, it's something that you want to know exists um, and that you should certainly evaluate if you're using popular tools like MySQL or Postgres um, or Couchbase, as mentioned. Um, all of these uh, stateful applications uh, should have operators that are open and available and easy to install on your Kubernetes cluster. So the operator hub, uh, as pictured here, is sort of the, the current uh, go-to marketplace for uh, checking any of this out. If you want to try out an operator yourself, um, you can go here and grab a link for installing it on your own Kubernetes cluster. Uh, if you are so bold as to want to write your own operator or uh, create your own operator, uh, there are three uh, parts of this operator framework that are open online right now. This is from Red Hat. Um, so there's the operator SDK for doing the writing, uh, the operator lifecycle manager, or OLM, uh, which keeps track of all of the operators that are running on your system and gives you uh, interesting metrics and then operator metering, which exposes information like uh, how many resources or uh, you know, how reliable different operators have been um, running on your system. So it gives you all of the components you'd need to uh, keep track of these automated uh, sort of beasts. And um, I'd say the, the lifecycle manager and the metering uh, help prevent what I would call the sorcerer's apprentice problem. Um, that's an old story. If you remember uh, watching Fantasia, there's a version of it with Mickey Mouse uh, bringing a broom to life to help him with his chores when uh, the wizard leaves the castle he's in. Um, and soon enough, the brooms sort of start replicating out of control, automating their tasks of cleaning. Uh, you know, the, the potential is there for operators to do something similar. So uh, these components work together to sort of prevent that automated uh, fiasco of operators, um, you know, taking over the world, assuming their own behavior and um, kind of hijacking your cluster. So this keeps things nice and safe, um, but gives you a certain level of automation with that as well. So it's a nice sort of middle ground uh, with protection there. So uh, a natural question is given that Red Hat uh, has, you know, created this uh, their framework, are, are they owned by Red Hat? Uh, and the answer is no, they're, they're open source. Um, they had been around prior to Red Hat, uh, as noted CoreOS um, was sort of one of the creators of the idea. There are a handful of other operator tools available on the market right now. There are some for writing operators through Ansible. Um, there are some uh, for writing operators through uh, other sort of frameworks. Um, those are all open and, um, you know, sort of on the rise as well. Uh, I think the operator framework is just um, perhaps the most popular at the moment for uh, diving into that, if that interests you. And uh, finally, uh, you know, if operators do seem too complex for your stateful workload or uh, you like the idea uh, from that etcd slide of sort of simplifying the tasks that have to go into adding a node to your etcd cluster or uh, writing your own playbook for doing these things, um, a config map may be a good alternative to an operator. So uh, we touched on this briefly earlier, but uh, config maps just make it really simple to uh, store notes or store the location of certain resources in your Kubernetes cluster and make that accessible to you uh, as someone running a command. So uh, these can be a sort of, I would say, a low intelligence. They're not as smart as operators. They're not able to respond um, proactively to events that are happening. But uh, if you want to be the person pressing the button and making the system uh, come to life and do its thing and you want to cut out that uh, automation piece, 
uh, this can at least help uh, simplify the commands that you have to type in and, uh, you know, lessen some of the chance of a user error creeping in that might uh, cause uh, you to deploy something uh, incorrectly. That's great. So you were talking quite a bit about complexity. So what if uh, people want to reduce that complexity, complexity by consuming services from a major cloud provider? Does that change anything? Yeah, uh, it does. And I, I think that's actually a very common use case. So, um, you know, Kubernetes has distributions that are available on all of the major clouds uh, as a first party resource. And then uh, a lot of large tech companies also have their own Kubernetes distribution as well. So uh, this has been something that uh, the community that's been developing Kubernetes has been very conscious of uh, that, you know, part of the value of the cloud is consuming the cloud services that you're attached to. So uh, you should be able to uh, manage and consume those services as well. Uh, and the way to do this, uh, you know, there, there are two main ways really. Uh, one is just that most cloud providers these days uh, seem to have their own um, suggested tool for doing this. So uh, if you go to the operator marketplace, operatorhub.io, uh, there's this AWS operator uh, pictured here on AWS's announcement blog um, that allows you to consume AWS resources uh, through your Kubernetes cluster. And uh, it's, again, a uh, rel relatively straightforward sort of operation for doing that. Uh, this is an open source tool, so you can see uh, the code on GitHub. Um, there are also nice examples on GitHub that show you how to um, actually access this or, um, you know, press the button to get it to work. Uh, and similar to uh, the past Kubernetes uh, examples we used, there's just a simple YAML file um, for, for making this work. So uh, this is an example that would uh, access DynamoDB and uh, work with example table-name. Um, so uh, you know everything that you may want to tweak or you might want to do is relatively straightforward here. Uh, you can kind of get a sense of what's happening by uh, reading the YAML file top to bottom. Um, and what's really nice is this is uh, in the same exact format that you would work with any other Kubernetes resource. After you have the operator installed on your cluster, you're just submitting this YAML file to Kubernetes and boom, uh, you should have a service that is now example-table-name um, available to your applications to use uh, and consume. Uh, it's worth noting uh, that AWS is not alone here. So uh, Google has one uh, as well called Config Connector. Um, they uh, choose to brand this as a CRD, um, but you may uh, remember that term CRD, custom resource definition. That's part of what an operator is. Uh, an operator is just a CRD plus some automation and application logic. Um, and that's pretty much exactly what Google is doing here. So uh, if you were to call this an operator uh, and uh, you were talking to a Google engineer, I don't think they'd get angry at you. I think, uh, you know, that would be perfectly acceptable. Uh, but for whatever reason, um, this has its sort of own branding and may not be available uh, on the same operator hub that you're accustomed to. So if you want to access this, this is available on uh, Google's documentation uh, as pictured, and we do have a link to this at the end of the deck. Um, but again, the point is that uh, you can consume these cloud resources uh, using these, these operators that uh, make connecting to the cloud a little bit more straightforward and easy. Um, you can also do it uh, the same way uh, we procured uh, those other resources earlier, which was um, exposing a database that maybe you manage on a VM. Um, that technique may work as well. It's just a little less automated, uh, a little less uh, of some of the chores are done for you. But um, this is really a great way to go if you're consuming Kubernetes and you're using it on a cloud, maybe not on-premise. Um, it, it allows you to uh, expose the services that are on the cloud without you know, having to open your cloud console and um, jump around there uh, to see see what's available. Uh, it gives you a, a single uniform interface, which is Kubernetes itself. Um, and again, that, that's sort of the promise of Kubernetes being the Linux of the cloud, that Kubernetes becomes the interface for 
where you do or uh, how you perform most of your work. Uh, finally, uh, we should cover that uh, there, there is one last option called the service broker or service catalog. Uh, and this uh, is an option that uh, comes with a fair bit of caution. Um, it's an idea that appeared sometime around uh, you know, the same era of when operators were first being developed. Uh, it comes from Cloud Foundry initially, uh, which I believe pioneered this and developed this uh, before Kubernetes was even um, sort of a concept. So uh, the Kubernetes group thought it might be a good API to bring forward to Kubernetes itself. Um, but, uh, you know, if we dig into sort of the, the page that has information on this, uh, you'll note that they're, they're, they're discussing working towards, um, you know, improving issues with Kubernetes 1.9. Um, however, uh, you know, we, we are on Kubernetes 1.15 now, and I think I just saw news that 1.16 uh, is in beta uh, at the moment, like either today or tomorrow. So uh, that's coming very soon as well. Uh, you know, suffice to say, this is a, a fair amount of, uh, there's a fair amount of distance between this and the latest version of Kubernetes. So it seems like operators have sort of won. Um, all of the major cloud vendors have embraced operators um, and provide sort of a, a first uh, party operator that they have blessed and said, this is our preferred way for you to consume our services on Kubernetes. Um, so uh, definitely reach for those. Uh, just be aware that the, the service broker or service catalog is still linked and may still be mentioned in the same spaces uh, as a lot of other stateful tools, but uh, it seems like it may be a bit unmaintained or slightly out of date. So, uh, you know, uh, proceed with caution with these. Uh, I, I think personally that operators accomplish much the same thing but they're easier and more straightforward to use. Um, and perhaps that's why operators uh, have sort of pulled ahead uh, in terms of the preferred way to automate your, your interconnection with uh, various cloud resources. That's a really great perspective. Uh, thank you for that. So, uh, you know, you mentioned, you know, storage and persistent volumes and persistent volume claims a little bit earlier, but I think at this point it might make sense to go back uh, just for a couple of minutes and look at the storage layer again and how that impacts the decisions as you're rolling out stateful applications. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. Um, so uh, as Ingo has noted, um, we have not really used the word storage much uh, in this presentation. We've used terms like stateful or stateless. Uh, workloads, and I think that is just sort of a broad term. Um, a stateless workload is generally seen as like NGINX web server, where the stateful workload might be a MySQL database or a Postgres database. So uh, a lot of the ideas that were covered in part one and two of this series, uh, you know, part one gives you some information about the why of Kubernetes, and part two really sort of dives into some of those uh, tools that are essential to connect your cluster to uh, a storage engine. So um, first you need a, a persistent volume that you can attach to your system. Uh, that will have a storage class associated with it. So what type of uh, sort of storage are you exposing? Is it a block storage or a file system? Um, that sort of information. Um, and then uh, you need to have an application claim uh, some space on that volume. So that's persistent volume claim. Um, you know, these are complicated topics and uh, I probably won't do them enough justice uh, covering them in a couple seconds here. Uh, but it's worth noting that these are important moving parts uh, of the system. And if you're looking to get more information about how to set that up, and how to manage those resources, part two of this webinar series is uh, really great for doing that. And, uh, you know, as uh, noted, uh, you know, part two also has uh, some great diagrams that kind of map out the relationships between these various uh, items. So um, you can see storage path being connected to a persistent volume claim here. Uh, the persistent volume then 
uh, gaining information from uh, that release uh, and exposing a database, in this case MongoDB, uh, to a pod. Uh, and I, if you remember from earlier, a pod is just a, a, another term for a collection of containers that might make up our application. So, uh, you know, this is how we would expose storage to our application inside of Kubernetes. Um, it seems very complicated when you first get started, but uh, once you do the research, once you watch this one or two times, um, it'll seem fairly straightforward, I think. It's just uh, basically a three-step checklist to make sure you've got these important resources sort of set up for your system to hum along. Yeah, I agree. I think what we're hearing from customers is very often once everything is set up and once you have started consuming uh, volumes on a regular basis just becomes in second nature. Um, but I wanted to make sure we cover storage because after all, this webcast is hosted by the Storage Networking Industry Association. So certainly storage is very important, I think, for a lot of folks in this audience. So uh, maybe we can spend a, a, just a few minutes just kind of uh, as part of the wrap up to go through what are the key points, the key takeaways for the audience after all this, all this great content you presented over the last 45 minutes. Sure. Yeah, let's let's review. Uh, so at the beginning, we covered uh, you know Kubernetes is the Linux of the cloud, um, and that means that uh, it's sort of the new way that most people are interfacing with uh, their infrastructure. That could be as a developer or as an operations person managing the infrastructure. Um, there are a lot of great resources online for uh, learning about these things. Um, there are proven tools that um, seem to sort of be valued. Uh, and more popular than others, like HashiCorp Vault or um, whatever your cloud's key management services. These are great for storing secrets. Um, and again, secrets are just the way you're going to store the username, password, uh, token, uh, any sensitive information, um, how you're going to expose that to your container uh, to have your application consume. Um, you want to think deeply about. Uh, and if you're learning how to do this for the first time, there are some great tutorials on Katacoda, uh, like in browser tutorials. There are some past webcasts, like in this series, that uh, will cover information uh, that should be pretty valuable. Um, and then uh, the Kubernetes security book uh, is on the Aquasec website right now, or if you want to purchase that with some dollars, uh, you can go to uh, O'Reilly Media. Um, and grab that, and uh, I believe there's also an online web page version of that book that should have some free information if you just want to preview uh, that as well, and that should be included in our links section that's coming up here. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are basic ways to run stateful workloads on Kubernetes that we discussed. Um, you can do it you know, using your existing pooling on the VM, which is very easy. All you have to do is uh, learn about services on Kubernetes and add a YAML file to your cluster. So that's great. That means you get to use all of your existing tools and, uh, you know, you're off to the races. All you got to add is Kubernetes at that point. Um, if you decide that there's some value in uh, how Kubernetes manages things at scale, say you're running hundreds of databases or, um, you know, too many to manage as individual VMs, um, then you can start looking at tools like stateful sets or operators. Um, operators just add a little bit more automation to the process um, as compared to stateful sets. Um, but those are great options. Uh, they just have a little bit more complexity. There's a little bit more learning that you have to uh, engage in before you can sort of tackle that. Um, and then cloud managed services are also available to you uh, if you're consuming resources uh, through Kubernetes. So those can be exposed in a similar way that uh, your VM is exposed, but uh, most cloud providers also give you an operator, um, which makes it really easy to consume those resources. Um, the last bit that we covered is uh, service brokers. Um, and uh, it's, it's worth noting, whoops, I think I skipped the slide there. Sorry about that. Uh, well, it's worth noting that service brokers are, uh, I, I would say, not recommended at this point. There, there are a couple versions behind Kubernetes. Um, so you really want to be careful if that's, that's the route you decide to go. Because um, it, it seems like operators have sort of uh, fulfilled the same role and become much more popular. So 
Uh, I'd just say proceed with caution on that front. That's great, fantastic. So my last question for today is why is this quote on uh, the next slide sticking with you or has stuck with you as you were going through the container journey yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we, we heard from Kelsey uh, at the front of the presentation here. Um, and, you know, this is just a reminder uh, if, well, you're, as storage professionals, networking professionals, you're probably well aware that uh, running stateful services is complicated and um, adding containers to that, uh, you know, is just complicated plus containers uh, still equal complicated. Uh, for the most part. So uh, if you are running uh, storage or uh, storage uh, type services, stateful services on Kubernetes, um, consider sticking with your existing tools and infrastructure as much as possible. Um, and, you know, starting to learn now uh, with some of the resources and tutorials we've provided, um, how when you get to scale, uh, Kubernetes can help you kind of leverage that. That's great. Thank you very much. Over to Mike. Yeah. Thank you, Ingo and Paul. That was uh, fantastic information, and we did our best to capture a number of the links that Paul referred to in the presentation. You're certainly not going to be able to copy all these down, but if you go to the attachments tab at the bottom of your console, there's a link to a blog that we published today with all of the following links in this slide and the next slide within it. And further, the blog invites you to provide feedback and give your own links if you have great useful information. So please take a look at the, the attachment, uh, read the blog, and even provide feedback and contribute your own links. Also, the presentation will be available for you. It will be uh, distributed. So you'll be able to grab a bunch of information that Paul referred to today as well. We're going to cover a couple of questions that have come up, but before I just wanted to remind you before you sign off, please give us a rating on the webcast. Uh, we do our best to take your feedback and incorporate it and use it to improve future webcasts. We understand there were some audio difficulties, so if you must downgrade us for that, we understand. But more importantly, we'd love comments on what you felt about the actual content of the presentation. So please, before you leave, do go ahead and, and give us a rating. So just a couple of questions, and if we don't get to your question, uh, we will be publishing a follow-up blog with the questions, so feel free to ask your questions still if you haven't. But Paul, just a, a couple of questions in the interest of time. We're, we're not going to get to all of them, but you did talk a little bit about some of the modern databases running on Kubernetes, even though you started with the premise that maybe it's not the best idea to run your, your enterprise apps on Kubernetes. What about the more traditional bit databases? Are there databases which are better or worse suited for running on Kubernetes? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say the databases that are better suited seem to be the ones that have uh, leaned into the container uh, kind of revolution that's happened over the past five years. So uh, one that comes to mind is CockroachDB. Um, it has really great documentation and uh, a lot of examples of how to set up Cockroach uh, cluster on Kubernetes. And the databases that seem to work best are like Cockroach in that uh, they allow you to do some amount of clustering um, sort of innately. Uh, another popular sort of database to run on Kubernetes is something called Vitess, um, which is really just a uh, clustering layer that I believe sits on top of MySQL or MariahDB. Um, and that's used by uh, some very large companies and uh, I believe currently is in the, the incubator or uh, one of those early phases uh, from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So um, there's some, some decent development muscle um, working on that project to improve its experience for uh, running on top of Kubernetes. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, one more question. I know we're running short on time, so we'll probably end with this question. But what about the on-premise versus 
cloud. You, you talked about both situations, but when is it appropriate to run stateful apps on-premise versus in the public cloud? Oh, I mean, uh, it. I, I would say the cloud, uh, you tend to benefit most from uh, the either the managed service or the elasticity. Um, you know, we we like to pretend that the cloud is sort of a, a one-factor decision for most people. Uh, some people say it's about bursting workloads. Um, others might say it's cost savings, but the reality is there's maybe eight uh, different factors that go into the cloud. Um, so I, I'd say you're either looking at uh, a managed system like Aurora or uh, AWS RDS, um, or you know Google I think has Cloud SQL, um, Microsoft has Cosmos DB. Um, every cloud provider has their sort of variant of a managed uh, database, which can be really nice if you're a smaller uh, sort of shop that uh, doesn't employ a lot of database architects. Um, I would say you know running or Um, you know, things like GPDR and, uh, you know, e even if you're uh, in a specific country or working with specific governments, they may have rules about uh, managing and uh, running your own sorts of systems for uh, the software that you sell them. Um, so there, there are a number of reasons why it may be more beneficial to uh, manage things on-prem. Um, and they tend to come down to external factors, in my experience, uh, like those regulations or like those uh, sort of customer concerns. Um, and once that happens, you tend to fall into uh, what's called data gravity. Um, you you want to move your compute to your data, not move your data to your compute. And uh, the value of Kubernetes is that it works on the cloud. It works uh, on-prem as well. So uh, wherever your data lives, um, you can bring the compute there instead of uh, doing the opposite, more difficult task of uh, moving your data uh, somewhere else. Fantastic, Paul. Thank you very much for all the useful information today. And Ingo, thanks for helping guide Paul through the presentation. I just wanted to remind everybody real quick, rate us on your way out the door and hit the attachments link before you go and uh, access the blog with all of the relevant links that Paul mentioned in the presentation today. With that, we are going to wrap up. Thank you again, Ingo and Paul. Appreciate all your time. And everybody have a great day. Thanks very yeah. much. Thanks, everyone.